Okay, class, today we're going to look at one of the most controversial presidents in U.S. history, um, Andrew Jackson, um, considered for by many to be a symbol of the rise of the masses. Now, um, let's first look at his first try to become president in 1824. He, he and others, uh, four, three others, and totaling four, you know, all run for presidency claiming to be Republicans. Jackson has a strong appeal, appeal in the South and the West. Um, but one of the things is like when you have so many um, people running for president and the way our constitution's set up, if you do not, do not get a m majority of the electoral college votes, then it, the race is decided by the House of Representatives. And that is exactly what happened. When you have four people running, um, you know, no one's going to get a majority of the votes, especially when they're all calling themselves Republicans. Here you can see Jackson did get 99, but Adams is, you know, close at 84. And pretty much they divide up and spread out the Electoral College to the point where no one really has the majority needed to become president. So that the 12th Amendment says that it goes to the House of Representatives. And in the House, um, Henry Clay has to step out because he's Speaker of the House and he gives a deciding vote. And um, there, there's already some hatred between um, Henry Clay and um, Andrew Jackson, so that doesn't bode well for Jackson at the time. And uh, the one person that Jackson decides to throw his weight toward is um, Adams, John Quincy Adams. Well, from see to eye, eye, eye to eye on, on the American system and nationalism, and um, they have what we call, you know, a meeting in what we would refer to nowadays as a backroom deal, in which um, Adams promises Clay um, the, the position of Secretary of State if Clay will throw votes his way and make him President of the United States. Now, the Secretary of State is, a, you know, it's a pathway to the White House. Most Secretary of States become President of the United States. And, you know, this is where you learn your statecraft and meet with other world leaders. So, you know, it's, it's a good deal all around, but, you know, really it is, you know, a, a little shady dealing for in reality. And this is something Jackson and the supporters point out right away. They don't see this as a legitimate election. They see it as an election that was stolen from the American people and, by the, and the will of the American people was circumvented. Um, Jackson himself was a sec decent Secretary of State. Um, he really did not have, you know, a lot that you, you could say against him at the time, except for this corrupt bargain as it became to be known. You know, Jackson was more, you know, more nationalist, federalist, you know, fed, you know, he promoted and was on, uh, an adamant voice for, you know, for the federal government leading the way and creating infrastructure in order for America to industrialize. Um, but one thing that um, made him fall out of favor with a lot of Americans, and not only because he was promoting big business and stuff like that, so that you know didn't endear him to the people in the South and West, but also expansionists, because um, many people were making their way into Georgia illegally, into Cherokee territory, and eventually some gold is found there, and they're trying to take this land away from the Cherokee. Um, but you know, um, Adams has, is having none of it. He wants to honor the treaties. So that's once again, leaves him very unpopular when it comes to people, especially in the South and the West and expansionists. So this sows the seeds for, you know, um, the next campaign. And when it comes to president Andrew, I mean, when it comes to Andrew Jackson, he starts his, um, um, bid for presidency the day he loses the first time. And, you know, basically always, you know, um, reiterating him to his people that, you know, the election was stolen from you. And, you know, I'm the man to bring back the voice of the, of the common man because these people are all from the East, East Coast. They're all about northern sentiments. These are all about big business on the backs of the poor. And mudslinging went, you know, both ways. And Jackson was a... Uh, it was highlighted in many press reports that um, Andrew Jackson was dating his wife while she was still married to another man. This became a huge issue. Eventually, his wife dies of a heart attack, and he blames his political enemies for inciting this heart attack. On election day, you know, when it comes to where, how the Electoral College is split, Jackson pretty much wins the South and the West. Um, Adams basically gets a few states in the Northeast. And Jackson, but Jackson clearly gets the majority 
of the Electoral College. So when you see this map, you can really see how it, you know how it went. And Jackson pretty much had a landslide with Adams only getting a few states in the Northeast, those that support Amer the American system and um, you know promoting um, mercantile. I mean, promoting the uh, industrialization of the United States. Now Jackson was, you know, he was a guy who, you know, said he, you know, he's for the common man, the voice of the poor, but this man owned one of the biggest um, mansions in Tennessee and owned the most slaves. This was not a poor man. But a lot of people saw his humble beginnings as like, you know, he's connected to us, he'll look out for us. He's from the West, he's in the South, he's an Indian killer, and he's an extremist. And these were all things that, you know, Jackson's people wanted. And so when Jackson takes office, he comes in in the middle of a huge controversy. Um, there was a, um, in the time period under this American system when they're looking to expand, to expand industrialization into the United States, uh, one of the first things they do is they put in this protective tariff. And this tariff was put in because of these men, uh, men who are manufacturing you know, um, had manufacturing plants in the Northeast, wanted Americans to only buy from them. So they started taxing imported goods, which was well and good for them, but not well and good for the people of the South who export goods. And whenever you put a protective tariff on people's goods, then that, was, that country will put tariffs on your goods. And basically you're just shooting yourself in the foot, which is exactly what was going on. And this was became known as the tariff of abominations because although it was good for the East Coast, the Northerners, it was not good for the South. They were doing, their economy was going bad, you know, farms are getting foreclosed. This is not a good thing. And people in the South saw it as the North or the federal government imposing their will on them. In fact, there, you know, the, the Northeast um, businessmen were making money and they felt like you're making money off our backs because we're the ones literally paying for you to make money. And when it also comes to any time there's like a there's an argument between the North and the South, the South is always framing it in the next thing will be slavery. If they can oppose their will on this, they will impose it on slavery. And this is really what always is at the end of any argument between the North and the South and the Southwest is that they think that, okay, you know, the federal government's opposing its will here, but, you know, that's that's just opening the door for, you know, the next question will be like, oh, we're going to get rid of your slaves. That's always in the back of their heads. And one area of, of complete, you know, um, anger toward the North and was South Carolina. South Carolina, um, led by one of the representatives, John C. Calhoun, he writes this essay, um, the South Carolina Exposi Exposition, in which he um, tries to promote this concept of nullification of the tariff laws. He's like, and there he is, um, and he's basically telling his constituents, the best way to solve this thing is to solve it ourselves by not enforcing it. This is known as nullification. Now, when he tries to get um, Congress to go his way in South Carolina, there's still some submission men, men with ties to the North that don't want to do this. But eventually, when the... Um, when the next congressional elections go through, they're voted out and there's a new group in and they're ready to nullify this law. And they declare to the federal government that the, the, they're gonna see this thing null and void and if you try to enforce it, we will secede from the Union. This is one of the many times we come close to the Civil War before the Civil War. In fact, we come extremely close right here. And one of the things when it comes to the election of Jackson is Jackson's, you know, in their head, he's one of us. And therefore, when he becomes president, he'll get rid of this tariff. And this is kind of what's the one of the thinking going by, going through people's heads when they vote for Jackson. And when Jackson takes office, this is the hot potato he gets thrown. And Jackson, who normally probably would have sided with them, but Jackson does not like his authority question. Here they are saying, we're not going to do what you ask me to do. And he's the head of the fair government. He's the one giving the ask. And here they are saying no. And nobody says no to Jackson. And this man is ready to invade the South. He's getting the army together. He's going to invade the South. And pretty much they're you know, about to have a civil war. 
Um, Henry Clay fortunately steps in to try to find a way to bring this, you know, cool the tensions down. So two laws get passed when he promotes the Compromise of the Tariff of 1833, which says that those tariffs will slowly be lowered. But if they, you know, and but at the same time they pass the Force Bill, which allows for the use of troops to enforce this tariff if they don't enforce it. So basically, you know, we'll get there, but we're going to go gradually, but you have to enforce it. Otherwise, you know, Jackson's threats of invasion would be real. And he becomes the hero of the day. He actually, you know, he leave, you know, stops what could have been the Civil War at that point. You know, and this is one of the many stopgap measures that happens between you know, the 1800s all the way till finally the Civil War breaks out in 1861. Now, Jackson is an expansionist. He's an Indian fighter. And um, when it comes to uh, what happens in Georgia, as I mentioned before, um, people are, in, the state of Georgia is trying to encroach into Cherokee territory. Now, the federal government, the constitution recognizes the sovereignty of these nations. It's in the constitution. And so, um, legally, that's their land. And so, what happens in Georgia is Georgia starts to admit some whites to come in, some Christian missionaries, and um, the state of Georgia, who's trying to get them out, starts to not allow these people to come in and try to kick them out. And yet, you know, the, Georgia, uh, the Cherokee are like, you have no right to kick people out of our own territory. We invited them. They're our people. This is our land. And this, you know, becomes, you know, goes all the way to the state Supreme Court. Now, a little background on the Cherokee is the Cherokee have adopted everything you could think of so they could, you know, be considered like white people. Like they had plantations. They had colleges. They had, you know, newspapers. They even had their own Congress. They did everything to mimic what white men did. That's why they're considered one of the five civilized tribes because, you know, they were trying to fully assimilate into white culture, into white society, so that they would be considered white and treated as white and their land honored. Georgia moves to seize Cherokee land, and this becomes the famous case, Worcester, Worcester versus Georgia. And it goes all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Cherokee, saying that is their land granted to them in the treaties, you cannot take it. But Jackson ignores this. In fact, he says the famous sentence is like, you know, you know, they 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 made their case. Now let's see them enforce it, because they don't enforce law. Supreme Court only interprets law. He's the enforcer of the law, and he sure as heck can afford it. And this is one of the failings of the three branches of government. This is when we say Jackson leans toward becoming a dictator, because he pretty much just does his will. So much for separation of powers. You know, he's just ignoring the way the Constitution set up the government so that no one man can control everything, and here he is doing it. And he saw, you know, himself, as, he saw the um, Native Americans as children, as not fully developed people, and he was their father, and he knew what was best for them. And what was best for them is to get out. The Indian Removal Act of 1833 removes all Native Americans on the, uh, to the other side of the Mississippi, forcing them uh, to be rounded up in camps where thousands died, and then thousands more died as they were marched out beyond the Mississippi through the cold of winter. And this was, you know, a very tragic event in US history. You know, and, and the Native Americans did what they were, you know, supposed to do, follow the law, went to the courts, got redress of their grievances by the courts, and yet still that was ignored so that they could be removed, you know, so the United States could expand its territory and people could go into Georgia. And when they went into Georgia, you gotta imagine these, you know, the Cherokee had businesses, they had homes, they had plantations, they had money, they had all kinds of stuff, none of which it could take. So basically, it was like a transfer of wealth from, you know, um, property owned by Cherokee. You know, people took it, and the state of Georgia took it, and people took it and occupied their territory. And this is a horrible picture because, you know, it makes it look like they were all warm and comfortable, but really, they were not. They were walking with whatever they could carry on their backs. And, you know, people, you know, there's a bunch of um, primary sources described just what, you know, what desperate 
people they, they look like and how you know um, they they could really see the suffering in their eyes and how some of them dropped dead along the road. So this moved a lot of you know all the tribes supposedly out west past the. Now the, you know tribes didn't take it. Um, they they didn't take it sitting down. There's a huge resistance known as the Black Hawk War among the Seminole Indians who have been allowing slaves into their um, tribe and, and waging this guerrilla war through the um, Florida swamps. The Seminole tribe is known as the uh, unconquered tribe. Even though they lose the Black Hawk War, they really don't leave. They just go deeper into the swamp so people leave them alone. So they really never really, they call themselves never really lost a war, which is why they refer to themselves as the unconquered tribe. Here you can see some images, a lot of them had their African blood because like I said, they were allowing Africans to come live with them who escaped from the South. Now Jackson's next big fight was with the Bank of the United States, this hated bank that especially people in the South and the West who didn't get easy credit like other people got, hated this bank. And they were looking to um, destroy it. And you know, and a lot of people still had this notion that the federal government should not be in the business of any large bank, that it gave them too much power and so forth. So, and then the guy who ran the bank, Nicholas Biddle, was considered to have like, you know, uh, unlimited power because of the, uh, the connection to wealth and to the control of the money in the United States. And he wasn't really an elected position. He was a political appointment. So people saw him like, you know, being kind of like a dictator. And so, you know, this is who they aim their anger at in the bank itself. And this is who Jackson's people want him to do something about. And that's what Jackson does. And so this is known as the Big Bank War of 1832. And um, Jackson's up for re-election. And in the hopes of getting him out of office, they Henry Clay and uh, Daniel Webster tried to make it an issue during the election year by trying to ram through a bill to recharter the bank, even though it still had time before it needed to be rechartered, just to make it an election issue. And they figure, well, you know, anyone who's for the bank and, and for Jackson might lose um, might lose their hopes of Jackson and move back to another candidate so that they can keep the bank. You know, um, and Jackson's thrown this bill in front of him and, you know, he knows that he can't sign it and he vetoes it. And basically the bank, even though it's still alive because it was an early recharter, he's out to end the bank once and for all right there and then. And Jackson, um, in vetoing the bank, even though it had already been seen constitutional by the Supreme Court, you know, that they could remain in power, he decides he's going to get rid of it anyway. And so what he does is he denies the charter that they already have. And even before it could expire, he takes all the money out of the bank. And this is while it still has a congressional mandate, Supreme Court said it was legal, and he does this on his own and he removes the money from the U.S. bank, in effect, killing it. And then he turns to what is so-called pet banks. Anyone who opened a bank, you know, some of his are his friends, and to put the federal government's money into these pet banks. A lot of these were only open long enough to get the deposit, then they were shut down and pretty much ran with our with the federal dollars. And, you know, basically a lot of federal money was, dis you know, disappeared into the hands of these bankers. And so, you know, we see a big mishandling of federal funds by Andrew Jackson. And so his uh, opposition begins to grow. People see him as like, you know, going beyond the power of the president, ignoring the three branches of government. And there's a lot of opposition growing on the other side against Andrew Jackson. You know, the Whig Party is, you know, created and they're mixed with a mix of people that would, you know, some from the South, some are industrialists, all with the same idea that, you know, he's put too much power into the presidency. And also, we really do want to fund, you know, these improvements to promote business in the United States. So a lot of these people may have come from his party, may not, but they were growing this opposition against Jackson because of him, you know, going beyond the presidency and because, you know, he's killing business in America. And so this becomes the opposition toward Andrew Jackson in, in the new party of the Whigs. Now, 
around, in the, around this time, we have Texas coming back into the picture. And this happens because in 1821, Mexico gains its independence, and they need to maintain some sort of foothold in Texas. And they, they continued what Spain was doing by allowing some Anglos to settle in Texas, you know, with the promise that they, you know, they would swear allegiance to Mexico, convert to Roman Catholicism, follow American laws, I mean, Mexican laws, a lot of which they ignored, but they brought these people in. First, you know, Moses Austin starts it, Stephen F. Austin ends it. Um, and there was a lot of people who weren't happy with living in America and decided we're going to go over there. But a majority of them actually were coming over, you know, to trade with slaves because importation of slaves were, was um, banned in the United States because they, we were by that point growing our own. And so if you wanted to make money importing slaves, the best way to do it is land somewhere that's not the United States, which would be Texas. And so a lot of them, like, you know, David Bo um, Jim Bowie and, all, and Crockett and all these, were making money not just in land speculation, but bringing slaves in and sneaking them in the back uh, of the United States. All this comes to a head when they outlaw slavery. Mexico outlaw slavery. And um, so when Mexico decides to outlaw slavery, you know, a lot of people are making business off slaves, not just importing them and selling them, but also using them in plantations. And then you have a lot of illegal and illegal immigration in Texas. And slowly they're setting up their own cities, ignoring Mexican laws, creating their own government, creating this huge friction between Mexico and, you know, and the Texas settlers, a lot of which were coming over simply to annex Texas into the United States. Um, and, um, Stephen of Austin goes to um, air his um, anger at some of the things that the Mexican government has done, especially um, abolishing slavery and then abolishing some of the rights and privileges that Anglos had, including non-paying men of taxes um, that were now being revoked. And so, you know, he, he comes to speak up for them. He ends up in jail and people start to like, oh, that's it. We're going to, you know, rise up and make our own country and eventually annex ourselves to the United States. So that's kind of what it does, you know, that's what, you know, there's Sam Houston, the leader of the army. And so in 1836, they declare their independence and they were pretty much already acting like they're independent. Um, and they began a war against um, Mexico to get their independence. And it becomes the famous fight at the Alamo which, you know, when you um, really look at what had happened, a lot of um, Sam Houston had asked them to abandon the, animal and the Alamo and join his army because he needed more men and he knew the Alamo could not be held, um, but they disobeyed his orders, stayed and, you know, and were eventually massacred. Same thing happened at Goliad, and these were the cries over the Alamo, remember Goliad? And um, this would lead, push on and on until eventually they, um, Sam Houston gathers enough people in order to surround uh, the Mexican army near San Jacinto and with the backs of the river and surrounded by you know, the Texas army after a quick battle in the early morning hours where everyone was still asleep, they, um, the Texans overrun them, capture them. You know, battle lasts about 20 minutes, but, you know, um, they say the killing lasts for about two, three hours. Um, eventually, um, Santa Ana is found, and he is um, forced to sign treaties that were never ratified by the government of Mexico, so they weren't really worth the paper they were written on. And this is supposedly when Texas becomes part of the United States, but, you know, according, the Mexican government never ratified any of these treaties, so legally they weren't actually valid. And when he, um, re, you know, but at that point, um, Texas declares its independence and starts to set up a government, but also negotiations to be, you know, annexed into the United States. And, you know, that the annexation of Texas becomes another fight because slave or free, and it's going to upset the balance. And it has to go through two series of votes before it's actually annexed the United States. Mexico the whole time complaining that you can't annex a piece of Mexico. Um, because it's still sovereign Mexican territory, but they ignore it. And this will let you set the seeds for, sow the seeds for the Mexican-American War.